Come on, are you excited to be at church this morning? Oh, you guys sound good. You sound good. All across Connecticut right now, Middletown, Hartford, Bridgeport, North Haven, Connecticut, Springfield, Massachusetts, New Haven. Can we put our hands together and say good morning to our church family? Good morning. Hey, it's getting down to it. Location number seven, seven years, seven locations. Next week, Stanford, Connecticut starts 10 a.m. Rogers International School. We are so excited. Please be praying for our leaders in Stanford. It is gonna be an incredible, incredible launch. I'm believing God just for miracles, miracles in Jesus' name. So I'm really excited about that. Also, this last year and a half, I've been working on a resource that I am so excited to share with our church. And on May 13th, I get to do that. That is a new book we've been working on called Astonishing. And in the book, yeah, I'm really excited about it. In the book, I outline really what has Jesus accomplished for the believer and how do I apply that so that I can deeply understand who I am in him. I'm so excited to share this with you. So just stay tuned. It's, uh, it's coming out May 13th. So yeah, we're really excited. Been bleeding over this one. It's been, been years that I've been working on it, sweating over it, and uh, I'm just excited to share it with you. But we're in a teaching series right now. Where we're looking at the names of Jesus, we're going to be in John chapter 11, the names of Jesus. Jesus gives himself seven names in the gospel of John to help us understand who he is. And you know, I, I just think about this all the time. Uh, you may have heard this before. A.W. Tozer once said that what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. It's an incredible thought, and I believe it's true. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. How you see God frames the rest of life. And so Jesus gives us these seven names so that we can have a deep understanding of who he is, because you and I inadvertently have misconceptions about him. And so he's looking to change the way we think by showing us his identity. So in John chapter 11, we get the fifth name, the fifth name that he gives himself. Starting in verse 17, it says, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days, four days. Turn to the person next to you and say, that's a long time. That's a significant amount of time. That's pretty long. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, see, he missed his opportunity, right? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother, will rise again. Come on, turn to somebody next to you and say, we believe in the resurrection. We believe in the resurrection. Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Oh, I pray that you feel the presence of God as I read these words. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Wow, if you want to jot some notes down today, the title of the sermon is Living in purple, living in purple. It'll make sense as we get going. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'd speak to us today. I pray that you bring amongst us this morning a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. I pray that you would enable us by your grace to discern and understand your heart as never before. And I pray that you show us Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Do you consider yourself a timely person? Are you a person that is generally on time? Let's just, let's just do a little survey, all of our locations. How many of you would say, I'm early most of the time? Come on, be honest. You're sitting next to people you know. You're in the house of God. I'm early most of the time. All right, how many of you would say, come on, your spouse knows already, so you don't have to lie. Your friends know already. You would say, I'm late a lot of the time. I'm late a lot of the, okay, yeah, we're about 50, 50. How many of you would say, this is me, I'm not generally early, I'm not generally late, I aim for right on time. Anybody else is like, I'm a right on time kind of guy. If the service starts at nine, I will be there at nine. I'm not gonna be there at 8.50, I'm not gonna be there at 9.10, I'm gonna be there at nine. A right 
on time kind of person. You know, being on time is really one of the significant challenges of life. We are always, especially in our time and our culture, trying to be on time. And timeliness, not just with things, but with, uh, with, with all types of different elements of life. So, you know, you have to be on time for class. You have to be on time for a family event. You have to be on time for work. But it's more than that. There's all different types of things that we are trying to manage our moments. And it's, it's so important. You know, I think of, in my world, uh, I'm not much of a cook. And so anytime my wife or somebody asks me to cook something, I, uh, I struggle with the timing. Anybody else deal with this? You know, I feel like I never get it quite right. This last week, my wife said, hey, could you just put the hamburgers on the grill? Now, she's a woman of faith. That's why she asked me to put the hamburgers on the grill because for me, it's like it's never quite right. And so I'm like, yeah, I put them on there. And, you know, and what I did was if you're, if you're good with the grill, you'll know. I mean, I, I put the cheese on the cheeseburgers too early. And so now I'm flying blind. I can't even see the meat. I don't know how cooked it is, you know? And so I take it off the grill and I put it, you know, in the house and I bring it in and I'm pretty insecure about my skills on the grills. And so I, I kind of slice open mine. You know, I don't care if mine's all mangled. I need to know. I slice it open and it speaks to me. You know, it's like, I'm still bleeding and red. You can't feed me, you know? And so I go back out to the grill and now I'm insecure about it because I'm like, I was too early and too early is not cool. You got to be on time. And so... I waited too long, you know, and then they tasted like hockey pucks, you know, it was just like, you're good, you know. At least they're not undercooked, right? Too late, I missed the window, I waited too long. Some of us have been taught that God is like a master chef, you know? He's like a master chef. You've maybe heard somebody say, well, God's rarely early and he's never late, but he's always, he's right on time. Yeah, he's always right on time. But question for you, does that seem true in your actual experience in life? When you think about your life, does it actually feel like God is always right on time? Is that what you've experienced in your life? You know, think about your life. Maybe you went through a difficult miscarriage, lost a baby, didn't feel like God was right on time in that circumstance. Maybe you went through a terrible divorce or your family, someone in your family went through a terrible divorce. It feels like maybe God was too late or maybe things just, I don't, it just doesn't feel like, or maybe right now you're struggling with some health issues and you've been praying and you've been asking God for a miracle and you've been believing, but you're still sick. It doesn't feel like God is, I don't know if I'm talking to anybody today. Maybe you've had some dreams, you know, some hopes about the future, things that you want to see accomplished in your life. And you've put them before God and you've prayed and you've sought God, but it actually feels like you're going backwards. It doesn't feel like you're actually moving towards those dreams. Does it always seem that God is right on time in your life? I don't know what bubble you live in, but for me, when I think about this idea of God being on time, I frequently have to wrestle with the reality that it feels like he came too early or it feels like he missed the window and showed up too late. And so it's difficult for you and I to navigate this honestly. I remember years ago when I was in the, uh, the music world, I was part of a, a Christian worship music group and, and we were recording a, an album in Nashville and we were working with a very skilled producer, amazing guy, very talented, uh, creative. You know, he could just sit at a console and just make magic happen in the world of music. And, and so we started working with him and, and we would set up, you know, time for the studio. We'd say, all right, we'll be there at nine o'clock. And so we'd be there early because we were anxious, you know, and 9.15 would roll around and 9 30 would roll around we'd be calling him like hey where is he and now it's 10 o'clock and and then he'd come strolling up around 11 you know and we'd be like hey uh where have you been what he's like oh we said nine and it was like yeah we did you know and then, and then we would get in the studio and he would do this all incredible stuff. And then the next day we'd start up again and it would happen again. And then we'd say, well, let's do an evening session. And he'd be late for that. And then he would forget to pay the studio and they'd be kicking us out because we, I mean, it was like, Hey, I know you're amazing. I know you're brilliant, but you got to like get this whole like timing thing down because it is driving me crazy. Do you know anybody like that? You're like, yeah, that's my husband or something. Like that. Yeah. You know, maybe you do. I feel like sometimes if we're honest, we think about God. And it kind of feels like that. 
It kind of feels like, well, God, I believe you're big. I believe you're powerful. I believe you're all knowing. I believe you're compassionate, but have you managed your time well? Because, because you know, that person was sick and, and we all prayed and, and we asked you for miracles to happen and, 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 and now they're, they're gone. You know, God, we prayed for breakthrough and we, and we prayed that you open up a window. We prayed that you'd provide and, and, and then there was bankruptcy. You know, when I look at my life and maybe when you look at yours, it seems that there is a struggle in this area of timeliness. In John chapter 11, some of Jesus' closest friends are confronted with an urgent situation. If you know the context of the chapter, it is an emergency. This man, Lazarus, who is a great friend of Jesus, is very sick. And so his sisters, Mary and Martha, send a letter or a messenger or something to Jesus. They say, hey, we need your help. You've worked miracles in the past. We've seen you heal the sick. Can you please come and pray for our brother? It is urgent. And we get a glimpse into Jesus' perspective in verse 5 of chapter 11. Look at it with me. It says this. It says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now, why do you think the writer, the apostle John, puts that in the Bible? He puts it in there because he wants you to be sure about God's intentions. Because as soon as you have an emergency, the very first thing that you're going to have to question and struggle with is the intentions of God. And some of us here, you're going through something right now, I'm prophesying to you, and the intentions of God have been under attack in your own mind because you're not sure what he thinks about things. Well, we told, we're told right here that he loves Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And that's important. But then we, look what happens in verse 6. Look, it says, so, everybody say so. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, check this out, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. He stayed two days longer. Now that word so in the original language is literally therefore. So what the writer is trying to get us to understand is there's a connection between verse 5, Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and a connection between verse 6, where he stayed in his place two days longer. And so this is a little confusing from our perspective, right? Because it says that he loves them, and yet he does not hurry to arrive. When he does arrive, we're told, Lazarus has been dead four days, four days so by the time he gets there, his body is cold. By the time he gets there, bacteria has already set in and the process of decomposing has already begun in Lazarus's physical frame. He's been in the grave four days. The time for a miracle has passed. You can't heal Lazarus anymore. The time for mourning has begun. Jesus missed the window. How is that love? Have you ever felt the tension between the claims of God and the actual behavior of God in your situation? Can we be honest today? Is that okay? You want to do like a fluffy sermon or you want to be like a real sermon? Okay, we'll do a real sermon. I don't really do fluffy that well. So um, last week we talked about the Lord is my shepherd, right? We talked about how God wants to lead you. He's the responsible party how he guides you, how he directs you. And yet here we are one chapter later, and this is a struggle. It doesn't seem to make sense. His behavior here requires some consideration. And this is for many of us where our faith hits a ceiling. And maybe you've been stuck in this place for a year now because your miracle hasn't come. Or maybe you've been stuck in this place for five years since you lost that loved one. Or maybe you've been stuck in this place for even longer than that since those things happened to you as a kid. But oftentimes what happens in our lives is we get to a scenario that we don't have a solution for, that we don't have a reason for, that we don't have an answer for, and we just sort of exist in the middle ground of faith, not bold, courageous, daring, and confident, but not completely rejecting and running away, but just living in the sort of, you know, in between of like, well, God, I know you're good, that's what you say, but my circumstances have told me this, and so I'm just kind of like existing. I wonder if you find yourself there right now because your ceiling, uh, the ceiling of your faith is, is right there in that tragedy, right there in that unanswered question. And you say, well, I guess I'm just going to stay here. But friend, what you need to see today is that the story of Lazarus was put in the Bible so that you could break through that ceiling. 
The story of Lazarus was put in the Bible so that you could have a faith beyond your circumstance. The story of Lazarus was put in the Bible to set you free and launch you into a bigger way of thinking. Somebody say amen. That's what God wants to do in our hearts today. See, I find within myself what I will call A, B thinking. A or B. And so I think this is how Mary and Martha thought. They said, Jesus, we need you to heal our brother, option A. And if you don't, he will die and no longer be with us, option B. So there's A and there's B. I need you either to heal him or I need you to fail me, right? Those are the only two options. So Jesus, that's what I need. Or, you know, Jesus, I need you to bring me the perfect someone, that spouse, that girlfriend, that boyfriend, that A, that's A. Or Jesus, I'm alone and frustrated, that's B. Jesus, I need you to fulfill my dreams by opening up the door for this job, A, or fail me and not open the door for the job, B, right? A or B, that's how we think. God, I need you to do it, so show me that you can. A, B, thinking, but here, Jesus doesn't come and come through in option A. He does not heal Lazarus. And yet Jesus also does not fail them, option B. And so we're stuck because Jesus has an entirely different agenda. And he gives us a clue into that agenda in verse four. Look at it with me. When Jesus heard it, that's Lazarus is ill, he said, check it out, this illness does not lead to death. Well, that's sort of not true because we know Lazarus dies, but it's more true because he says, it is for the glory of God so that the son may be glorified through it. Here's a thought for you today, church. What's the most loving thing God can do for you? See, I think that many of us think that the most loving thing God can do for us is make us comfortable. I think that many of us think that the most loving thing God could do for us is help us avoid all suffering and struggle. We say, well, the most loving thing he could do was just make my life completely seamless, easy. Now, if that's the primary way that God shows his love, then he must have hated the Apostle Paul, if you know much of his story. He must have hated the apostle Peter. I don't think God shows his love to us by making everything easy. See, true love will give you what you need most. And so the question is, what do you need most? And what Jesus wants us to see is that what you need most, I'm talking to somebody's situation right now in Middletown, right now in Hartford. What you need most is not comfort or ease. What you need most is a deep revelation of who he is. What comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. What you need most is to see him as he truly is. See, the most loving thing Jesus can do is give you what will bring you lasting joy. And lasting joy comes from an encounter with God. And so he allows Lazarus to die. He allows Mary and Martha to weep. He allows them to experience the suffering because he knows in the end it will bring a revelation of who he is. See, they hoped for a healing, option A, or Jesus could fail, option B. But he says, no, 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 no. I've got a whole different plan, option X. I'm going to bring a resurrection. Ha! <laughs> Oh, jot this thought down. Sometimes God reveals himself more through the miracle you don't see. Oh boy, we're messing with your world today. Sometimes God reveals himself more through the miracle you don't see. What does it mean to mature in Christ? To mature in Christ means to mature in love. And if you're to mature in love, you must discern the heart of God and then trust the means or the ways of God. Because sometimes God reveals himself most through the miracle you don't see. See, Jesus didn't cause Lazarus' illness, okay? Don't misunderstand his intentions. And he didn't cause your tragedy or struggle either, whatever you're going through. But he has a plan that is beyond your perspective. And so you're thinking option A or option B. And if you don't come through, God, you've failed me. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. I've got a whole deeper revelation of who I am that I'm seeking to show you through option X. I want to show you something specific. Look what happens in verse 20 when Martha starts to articulate her frustration. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to him. Mary remained seated at the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. See, option A, option B, you came, he survives, you, he dies, you didn't come. Those are my two options. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, 
God will give you. I like that. She's like, I don't know what you're going to do, but I do believe in like an option C though. I don't know what it is, but, but there's something there. I'm open to it. Jesus says, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. See, Jesus was setting her up here because that little phrase that he uses in the original language there, your brother will rise again. It was a common phrase that everybody said at a funeral. It was like, you know, if we went to a funeral today and said, oh, you know, uh, my condolences for your loss, you know. That was the phrase that the Jews used at the time at a funeral. They would say, your brother will rise again. And it was a way of saying, you know, we believe in the resurrection. That was the common Jewish belief in that day, that there will come a day when the dead will rise. And so your brother will rise again. And Jesus says it in such a way, you know, that the exact phrase, and, and Martha hears it. She says, oh, I know there's a, there's a future hope. I believe in that. I, I know that there is no resurrection now, but there will be a resurrection in the last day. And Jesus is saying, you know, you're thinking, Martha, too narrowly. And he says, no, that's not what I'm going for. And he responds by saying, Martha, you don't get it. I am the resurrection. Martha, I am the resurrection. She's thinking about a future day. And he's speaking of a present reality. Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He's saying, hey, I am God. I am outside of time. Think about this for a moment. Outside of time. I've already been, Jesus says, to the last day where the dead are raised. I've already been there. And I was already here on the first day before anything was created. Uh, the resurrection, Martha, you don't get it, is not just a future event. The resurrection is a person. And I am that person and I've come to reverse the brokenness of this world. I've come to heal the pain in your life right now. I've come to strip the power from death itself. And so he says, I am the resurrection and the life. I love how John describes Jesus once he has risen from the dead because the same man that wrote this book, the apostle John, also encountered the risen Christ after his resurrection. Look how he describes it in Revelation chapter one. It says, when I saw him, him. I fell at his feet as if I were dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. That was like such a New England clap for reading Revelation 1 verse 18. I mean, you could do a little better than that, can't you? Think about it. Such a, a careful clap. That's all right. I hold the keys of death and the grave. I hold the keys. Wow. Martha, do you know who I am? He says, I'm the resurrection. I like the second part, though. He says, and... I am the life. I am the zoe. That's the Greek word for life. I am the life. Now, scientists tell us that, that all matter is made up of atoms, right? You remember science class, right? All matter is made up of atoms. And, and atoms have at their center a nucleus, okay? And that nucleus has a, a proton, a neutron, electron. Everybody remember this? Yeah? You're like, no, I skipped that class. That's fine. Let me just, I'll teach you about it. So, so th that's what's happening inside of a nucleus, which is in the center of an atom, which makes up all the matter that you see on planet Earth. Now, modern Modern science, interestingly enough, has struggled to understand why the elements within the nucleus remain in the position in which they are. And so we don't really understand why they hold together. And so they've researched and tried to figure it out and tried to study it, but they have discovered that there is a something. There is a something that holds together the nucleus, which then holds together all of life, okay? And so they had to name that something because that's what scientists do. They figure out something and don't know what it is exactly and then name it so that we all feel a little bit better about ourselves. So they named the something that holds the nucleus together and keeps the proton and the neutron and the electron all operating in the way that they are supposed to operate. So they call it the strong force. They got real creative with that one. The strong force, that's what it's called. Jesus is saying, when he says, I am the life, you know what he's saying? He's saying the very 
essence of what holds together every proton, neutron, and electron that, that make up a nucleus, that make up an atom, that make up the matter, that makes up you. Every single little tiny piece of all of life woven together by something that holds it In Colossians chapter one, look what he says. He says, he is before all things, speaking of Christ, and in him all things hold together. Think about that for a second. Because right now in your life, you might be facing a hopeless situation, a hopeless financial situation, a hopeless relationship situation, a hopeless health situation, a hopeless career situation, a hopeless fill in the blank situation. You think, oh, well, the limits, are, the, the options are so limited. There's option A, there's option B, there's no option C. I just, I don't see any other way that this could work. I don't see any other way that this could be possible. And despair, it's so easy to let despair to start to creep in. And maybe you've been struggling with that depression. Maybe you've been struggling with that despair. Maybe you've been starting to feel that sense of hopelessness but what God wants you to see when he says, I am the resurrection and the life is that nothing is hopeless when Jesus is present. Nothing is hopeless. He says, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't have to follow some rules. I am the rule. I don't have to fit into some box. I am the box. I'm life. I am the very thing that holds the molecules of humanity together. Why do you think that I'm limited by what you can see? Oh, I'm telling you right now, right now in the name of Jesus across all of our locations, God is seeking to breathe hope into your heart. If there is one thing that should define the people of God, it is a spirit of hopefulness. A spirit of hopefulness because we have a God who has made it clear that he is the life. He is the life. Think about the hopeless situations in your life. Maybe you have somebody in your life that you've been praying for, that they would meet Jesus, and they seem so far away. You say, Justin, the whole way they look at life, the whole way they think about life, it's impossible for them to ever open their heart up to Jesus. They've got these walls and these barriers. They've got these insecurities and these offenses. They're never going to open up to Jesus. What are you doing there? You're thinking A or B. Jesus is saying, don't you know that prodigal you've been praying for? Don't you know that family member that you think is impossible? Don't you know I've got an X up my sleeve? Don't you know I've got a whole different plan? Or maybe you're here and you've got a, a health situation that you say, well, we've went to the doctors, we've done this, we've done that, we've tried everything. It just seems hopeless. I don't understand. I've prayed for healing. I've tried the practical route. Nothing seems to be working. What is God up to? He wants to whisper to your heart today and say, keep hoping, keep believing because every moment you have breath, I have a purpose for your life and you're not going to see all the specifics of how it's going to work out right now, but I have a plan and as you trust me, you will see that plan on unfold. When that voice of despair starts to speak to your heart, maybe even right now, it's trying to get your attention. Oh, I've got good news. The presence of Jesus is here. And before you leave today, he wants to inject your heart with a hope that comes from him. Oh, come Lord Jesus. Would you do that work in our hearts today? Would you do that work in our lives today? Look at the words in verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. This is so classic Jesus, because at first you have no idea what he's saying. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? What, right? Like, I mean, I mean, I read that. I can imagine, I wonder, sometimes I read the Bible and I see things that I don't know if they're necessarily there or not, but, but like, I could just imagine Martha's face in that moment, like doing the math, you know, like, wait, wait, if I die, I'm gonna live, but if I live, I'm... Can you repeat the question, Jesus? Like, what, what do you, like, wait, what am I supposed to do? Like, is this a riddle? If, if, you, if, you, if you're gonna die, yet you're gonna live, but when you live, you'll never die. Do you believe? It's like, uh, what am I committing to right now? I think so, yes, yes. We'll go with yes, like I think so. Like what, what are you trying to, what are you trying to say? I wanna illustrate this for you today because I think it's so important for you to grasp this. He says, he says, though you will die, 
And so that's important because he wants you to confront the reality that your physical body will die. Though you will die, yet shall you live, okay? So though you will die, you're gonna live. And if you live and believe, you'll never die. That's what he says. I'm the resurrection and the life. Though you will die, yet shall you live. Though, if you live and believe in me, you'll never die. What he's trying to get us to understand is that we are living, this is so important for your perspective because it will help you in understanding what God's saying to your situation right now. We are living in what we call the overlap of the ages, okay? The old theologians have called it many things, the now and the not yet. The in-between of the inauguration of the kingdom, which Christ accomplished, and the consummation of the kingdom, which Christ returns. So the now and not yet, the overlap of ages. So let me try to illustrate this for you today, okay? Imagine with me that my blue yoga mat, all right, don't judge me. My blue yoga mat represents your life, okay? This is your yoga life, okay? This is your life, all right? This is over here, this is the moment that you were born, okay? You know, December 16th, 1958, whatever it was, right? Not, you know, uh, June 14th, you know, 1983. Whatever your time was, bloop, that's when you were born. And now you're living your life, living your life, living your life, giving a life, yoga mat ends, okay? You are going to die. Not a very comforting thought for some of us, but by the time you leave today, I'm hoping that it's a little bit more comforting. So you're gonna end, okay? Your time on earth is going to end. Sometimes we feel like we avoid this, we don't think about this, we pretend it's not true, but this is reality. And between this line and this line, there's all this blue, all this living. There's success and failure, there's mornings and evenings, there's all this different life that's going on, right? Jesus is saying, you will die, and this is your natural life. We'll call this the age of Adam, okay? The age of Adam is your natural existence. It's the life that you live in the natural realm, and it's important for you to understand that this is real. Now, one question that haunts all of humanity in the age of Adam is the question that Job asked in Job Job chapter 14, when he says, if a man dies, shall he live again? If a man dies, shall he live again? So in other words, it's the question everybody's asking, what is the purpose beyond this life? What is the meaning? What happens at the end of the blue mat? What happens when I pass into the next life? If a man dies, shall he live again? Is this all there is? Do all I have is my little bit of time on this blue mat and then life ends? Or should I think about something different? Should I see something different? What happens after? And so Jesus steps in and answers the questions with the words, I am the resurrection and the life. What he's telling us is I have come and I'm not just a great prophet, I'm not just a good teacher, I'm not just a wise sage. You have to understand that I'm the thing that holds the atoms together, that I am the source of the universe, that I am the power and substance of life, that I am the creator God who designed all of life. I am that I am. I am the resurrection. I have come, and I've come and put on human flesh, and I've come and lived a blameless life, and I've come to substitute my life for yours, and so my perfect life has has entered into the age of humanity. And so here I am coming with my eternal, all existent, never ending life. And I have now stepped into your blue. I've stepped into your blue and I've become a part of your life. And as you've opened your heart to me, there is now an overlap between your blue life and my red life. But the good news that he wants us to understand is that as you have entered into me and I have entered into you in this overlap of the ages where there is both blue and red, what has occurred is that your spirit has become one with God's spirit, that your life has been intermingled with God's life. So when the blue mat of life ends, your life in Christ keeps going and the mingling has occurred so deeply that you're no longer blue, but now you're a mixture of the red and the blue. You're living in the purple in Jesus' name. Come on, turn to the person next to you and say, I'm living in the purple. I'm living in the purple. See, colors, oh, this is so cool. Colors 
have significance in the Bible, okay? Colors have all kinds of significance. For example, this is wild. In Numbers chapter four, we're told that when the temple would move from one place to another, the tabernacle would move, the people would wrap all of the holy instruments, all the holy things in blue, okay? And then they would cover those holy things. Once they covered them in blue carpet or blue uh, rug, they would then cover it again in red and overlap. God was showing us a picture, Numbers chapter four. But then we're told that the altar is the one place where they would mingle the dyes of the red and the blue. They would mingle those dyes and the altar where the sacrifice was made for the sins of the people, that was covered in purple. It was covered in purple because it was a picture. It was a picture of an overlap of ages. It was a picture where heaven's life and earth's brokenness intertwined. And that is exactly why in John chapter 19, when Jesus is dragged out in front of the people, the Roman officials throw a robe over his body. And we are told that when Pilate brings him out and says, behold the man, he's not wearing a green robe. He's not wearing a red robe. He is wearing a purple robe because he is the the inauguration of a new era. He is life itself mixed with my brokenness so that I can live forever. This is what Christ wants you to deeply internalize and understand. See, the real secret of Christianity is not just that one day you will be resurrected, which is a glorious, beautiful truth, but the real secret to Christianity is that in God's eyes, with Christ, you've already died. You've already been risen. You're already seated with him in heavenly places and his resurrection life is available to you right now. Right now. Let me show it to you in the Bible because you can't make this stuff up. His resurrection life available to you. Ephesians chapter two, it says, but God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It's by grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ. Notice the tense that Paul used. He doesn't say he will raise us. He says he already has. He raised us with Christ from the dead and seated us with him in heavenly places, heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. So from God's perspective, you are living in the overlap of the ages and the resurrection life of Jesus already abides within you. And so what should you expect in the midst of this overlap? What does it look like? Well, you've got the blue and you've got the red. And so both exist. So what we see is, yeah, you will be tempted. That's the blue. You will have flaws. That's the blue. You will be weak. That's the blue. You will get distracted. That's the blue. But at the same time, you will find within yourself, if you understand what is yours, you don't get set free by the truth. You get set free by the truth you know, right? And so if you understand what is yours, you'll discover that the red overlaps. And so in the midst of the blue, you have the power to overcome temptation, the power to conquer sin, the power to silence shame, the power to experience healing, the power to stand victorious because you're not living here anymore. You're living here in him. And so there's a power that the Holy Spirit has for you that is available now. Second Corinthians chapter four says it like this. Look at it. It says, now we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We're pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. So the resurrection life of Jesus is in you right now. And sometimes, come on, sometimes it manifests in a power to instantaneously heal from illness. And sometimes it manifests in an endurance to wait because the healing hasn't come. Sometimes it manifests in an instantaneous moment of breakthrough. And sometimes it manifests in a confidence without breakthrough. Sometimes it manifests in a peace that consumes anxiety. And sometimes it manifests in a joy in the middle of sorrow. Sometimes he gives you exactly what you want when you want it. As if he healed Lazarus 
before he died. But then sometimes he gives you himself and proves that's what you really wanted all along. Like raising Lazarus from the dead after the moment had passed. What we have to realize is that God has a plan and that that plan is good and that his purpose is working itself out in your life. But Jesus gives a condition to experiencing the red in the midst of the blue. And that condition is outlined three times in verses 25 and 26. He says, whoever believes, everyone who believes, do you believe, believe, believe. Because faith brings the resurrection of Jesus into your present situation. Faith brings the resurrection of Jesus right into your present situation. Whoever believes, everyone who believes, do you believe? I love the step of faith that Martha has to take before the story ends. Look at it with me, verse 38. Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Look at this. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. A or B? A or B? He's dead or he's alive? If I take this stone away, it's going to smell. Huh. See, Jesus has to be allowed to come near the things in your life that stink if he's ever going to bring a resurrection. That was worth coming to church for right there. Four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, there it is again, you'd see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes, one of the most candid prayers in all of scripture. Father, I thank you that you've heard me. And I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And he had said these things. He cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He called the dead by name out of their tomb. That's what he wants to do today. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound in linen strips, his face wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Jesus told them to remove the stone. And they hesitated. They hesitated because that did not fit into one of the options that they understood. To remove the stone in your life means to fully surrender to God's plan that you can't see. To trust in his purpose, even when it looks ridiculous. To believe in a God that has an option X that your mind cannot even conceive. They do this, and it releases the dead man from death and brings him back to life. So maybe you're here right now, and you find yourself frustrated with a God who missed his window frustrated with a circumstance that hasn't gone the way you expected. You say, Justin, God didn't heal. Justin, God didn't come through. Justin, God took that away. And since that happened, I've lived with this ceiling where I just can't get beyond it. I can't see past it. I can't trust past it. And God says to you, today is your day of resurrection because that ceiling is going to get torn down and you're going to see that even though A has failed and B has failed, I am the resurrection and the life and I had a plan you could not conceive and it will not fail and it will reveal my glory, it will lead to your good and it will show you who he is is. Come on, would you stand to your feet with me, all of our locations. Let's pray. The mistake that many of us have made is that we have put our faith in the possibilities that we can imagine. 
We put our faith in the possibilities that we can imagine. But today, God wants you to take your eyes off of the possibilities that you can imagine and put your faith in a person who is already resurrecting you. The seeds of his spirit dwell within you if you've trusted Christ, which means that the resurrection of power of Jesus already abides in your spirit. I want to pray right now that that resurrection life is made evident in you. And I would pray that a spirit of hope would right now fill your heart, that you would have joy and peace in believing, that you would be filled up to all the fullness of God, that you would entrust your circumstances into his hands and watch him call forth the dead in your life. Would you bow your head and pray with me right now? Spirit of Jesus, you know every detail in every person that can hear my voice right now. You know the broken places. You know the places that we have hesitated to trust you. Oh, Spirit of God, sweep through the room right now in Jesus' name. I pray in the name of Jesus that your living spirit of resurrection would awaken hope on the inside. That for dreams, for plans, for opportunities that have long passed, that you would enable us by your grace to entrust those things into your hands because you have a plan we couldn't see and a purpose that was for our good and that right now you are the resurrection and the life. So I speak to the dead places right now and I say, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus, come forth. Every dead dream, every dead hope, every dead passion, every dead ambition, every dead desire, every dead faith, come alive, come alive, come alive. Father, right now, I choose to remove the stone. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm going to trust that you have a plan. In Jesus' name. Come on, can we sing that up to God today?